but we have to start with the markets. Massive sell-off today. Uh, you just stepped across from, from the Goldman's office across the road. What were your traders saying was the reasons they were hearing for, for the selling? Well, we've seen a number of days that have been pretty volatile. Uh, you know, I think this is a continuation of a de-risking that's been going on for some time now uh, among market participants. I was on the trading floor. I did talk to a bunch of our traders, and and you know, I wouldn't call this day out as relative as unique relative to what we've seen, and other days, you know, in the last uh, couple months, uh, there is de-risking going on. I think I think invest market participants are, I think, more aware, more concerned, and reacting more directly to some of the risks that are accumulating in the broader economy and the broader marketplace. We came into the year, I would say, with a, a pretty heightened sense of optimism. Mm -hmm. when we, what we were hearing from clients in the first quarter, places like Davos and other gatherings where a number of clients would be in one place, it was a bit of an echo chamber on global coordinated growth, on you know, positive stimulus in the US economy in the form of a tax cut, positive stimulus in the Chinese economy in the form of just the industrial spending, investment spending that comes out of the government, a recovery in Europe that was stronger than mm -hmm. what had been predicted. So it was kind of up and to the right. It was a pretty, a pretty optimistic sense. I would say over the course of the year, that optimism has gradually waned as more data and more facts have become apparent. And those risks that were relatively muted in the, in the beginning of the, of the year and the conversation mm -hmm. have now become more in the frame. And so whether you look at Brexit, which is now you know, kind of right in front of us, you look at Italy, which became a, you know, a factor mm -hmm. in the marketplace on the back of the election, you look at the trade policy that the United States government has been focused on, not only with China, but in NAFTA and with the EU, risks are becoming more, you know, more re relevant and more prevalent. Obviously, the U.S. rate policy is now a big, a big factor in terms of how people are perceiving the relative hawkishness of, mm -hmm. uh, of Powell's comments or, or, or lack thereof. And so the, those risks are becoming, I'd say, more you know, more concerning the market participants. So what, what's interesting to me is the divergence between the sell-off and the de-risking we're seeing among the marketplace, institutional investors largely, mm -hmm. and what we're seeing in the real economy. The real economy, to me, seems like it's doing quite well, particularly in the United States. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk to CEOs, CFOs, other uh, executives in the real economy, clients of ours, their businesses are doing very well. They continue to invest. They continue to want to to be very active. We see M&A at, at very high levels, very strong levels. That's usually a pretty good indicator of CEO confidence. Mm -hmm. So there is a real difference between what we see on the, on the corporate side of life and what we're seeing in the market participant side of life. And I guess we've seen that difference throughout the day here at your conference. I mean, big bank CEOs from, from Jamie Dimon, Brian Moynihan, Tim Sloan, all echoing that very positive outlook on the economy. But their stocks, Goldman Sachs' stock as well, down sharply today. Banks are the worst performing sector, some moving down around 5%. Do you think there's an overreaction in investors' minds that even if we do get a recession, which is not expected, that banks are going to suffer as badly as they did 10 years ago? Would Goldman Sachs suffer that badly in the same circumstances? Well, listen, I think bank stocks are usually a leading indicator of the market's perception of the cycle. Mm -hmm. So that de-risking that we're seeing, which is very pronounced in bank stocks, is, a, is, is giving you a sense for how the market is perceiving the likelihood that we're going to see deceleration in the economy. We don't see that in the real economy, as I said. Mm -hmm. uh, our stock, obviously, and other bank stocks will perform more poorly if people perceive that there's going to be a deceleration in the economy. So we're going to have to see over time you know, what's reality. Mm -hmm. If we have a normal recession, not a crisis-driven downturn in the global economy, bank stock, banks will perform pretty well, certainly better than they performed during the financial crisis. So I wouldn't expect to see significant losses you know, in bank earnings. In fact, I'd, I would think banks would do quite well in a, in a downturn in terms of profits, maybe less well than they do in an upturn, but not anywhere near what you saw in the last, uh, in the last downturn in 08. And what, what about the volatility itself? 700 point move in the Dow, whether it's up or, or down. You're very much focused at Goldman Sachs on the changing way in which people trade. Is that changing nature of trading going to mean that we will continue to see bigger moves like this, 700 points in either direction? Well, you know, it's been a bit more volatile in the last couple months, but we've certainly seen volatility in years past. And I'm not mm -hmm. sure I'd call this out as a particularly unique moment of volatility. We are seeing a transition in many respects from what's been an easy money policy across the world on the back of the financial crisis mm -hmm. into what now looks like it'll be a tighter money policy. And that transition from what had been a pretty extraordinary amount of stimulus on, a, on the monetary side into a a gradual, hopefully gradual, period where it becomes less so, that's, a, that's an unprecedented thing for the market to absorb. Mm -hmm. So it's not surprising to us that there would be some dislocation along the way of that, of that deceleration in, uh, in the stimulus. 
coincident with concerns about global growth. So I think it's going to be volatile. Uh, I'm not overly concerned about the volatility. You know, our traders are are actually seeing a lot of activity. It's pretty orderly. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody's panicking. So, you know, we've seen down days before. We'll see down days again. It's good to hear that it's, it's orderly and no one's panicking. What does this volatility mean for Goldman Sachs's bottom line? Is it the, the good type of volatility that's driving trading revenues higher? Well, time will tell whether it's the good type of volatility or not. But I would say what I'm hearing from our, from our leaders on the trading floor and in the trading businesses is there is a lot of activity. Uh, people repositioning portfolios would generally be good for us. So I think you are seeing this, this as I said, accelerated de-risking mm -hmm. going on. I think people are getting more closer to home, you know, being a bit more cautious and moving in and out of assets and try to reposition themselves. That should generate a fair bit of activity and we would expect that activity to translate into more, uh, you know, more uh, revenues and profits for us and for others. What about IPO activity? A lot of big tech uh, IPOs slated for next year, Uber, Lyft, Palantir, WeWork, uh, the likes. Uh, does the big pullback, particularly in tech stocks that we've seen in the NASDAQ, does that delay those IPOs, do you think? Or, or do you reckon we'll still see a big wave? I know you can't talk individual names. Well, I next would year. say, as we sit here today, the pipeline in the equity business is quite strong. And I, you know, we've talked a lot, and you and I have talked a lot in other, you know, other interviews about the unicorns and the decacorns and the mm -hmm. other large technology companies that are going to have to go public at some point. We are starting to see a little bit of a tipping point coming into 2019 where more of those companies are deciding that they are in fact going to go public mm -hmm. in the near term. And persistent volatility will not be a good thing for that trend, mm -hmm. uh, but I wouldn't say one day that's down 800 is going to necessarily dictate where we go. But broadly speaking, we see a pretty good pipeline building of large scale IPOs, mm -hmm. not only in technology, but obviously technology would be a big driver of that. We see a, an enormous amount of activity in the biopharma uh, area. So, you know, emerging biotechnology companies, gene therapy businesses, mm -hmm. that's been quite productive for us, and I'd expect that to continue. So the pipeline is, the pipeline is good. I want to move on in a moment. We'll talk about uh, the changing shape of, of Goldman Sachs. But, but before we do that, just to, to dive into something that's been in the headlines a lot recently, the, the, the 1MDB uh, scandal. The, the DOJ said that Goldman Sachs had, quote, prioritized, quote, consummating deals ahead of the proper operation of its compliance functions. Is that fair uh, for, for the bank in 2013? Well, is it fair for the bank today? I, I, I would say the following. This is an ongoing investigation, so it wouldn't surprise you that there's a limited amount that I can, that I can say on the matter. Mm -hmm. But I would say the following. We've been engaged with the DOJ for some time now, really the better part of two years since we first became aware of the situation and, and, and the matter. Uh, we've assembled a team that's very focused on engaging with the DOJ, and we are, in fact, in very active discussions with the DOJ on the facts of the case. The rest of the firm is very focused on our client franchise, and David has asked me to spend my time highly focused on making sure that the rest of the firm is focused on the client franchise. Mm -hmm. I have been spending, as you and I were talking about earlier, uh, offline, more of my time in the chief operating officer role, mm -hmm. really working inside the firm to make sure the firm is operating the way the firm should operate, and in fact, learning some of the businesses that I need to get myself up to speed on. But in my free time, and on nights and weekends, I've been out seeing a lot of clients. Mm -hmm. I was in China last week, I was in Silicon Valley, the week prior, sure. and in those travels, I feel quite good about our client franchise, and our people are very engaged with clients. Mm -hmm. It is a moment, as we've talked about at the beginning of this discussion, where there's a fair bit of volatility, there's a fair bit of sure. consternation in the markets, and our clients need and want our advice and our perspective, and we're giving that to them, and that's, sure. it's, it's very much uh, in our mindset to be close to our clients. Sure. I, I, I totally understand you, you can't speak to the specifics of an ongoing uh, case, but, but whatever the facts of the case are, uh, when a big debt capital markets deal like this is done, it, it is reviewed uh, by a lot of bankers internally, by the Global Commitments Committee. So re regardless of what the facts are of who's proven to be wrong in the end, is, is there not a bigger lesson to be taken here about the quality of the review that was done internally on, on this deal? Well, as I said, I, I don't want to comment on the case because it's an active investigation. And, and, and that, that, that's, that's just not something we're going to be able to comment on. I feel quite good, I know David feels quite good about the strength of our compliance and control regime in the firm. We spend an enormous amount of time on it. We're incredibly focused on it. We've invested a lot in it over the last several years. Are uh, you and David boosting that, that kind of compliance function today since taking over the reins? Did it need to be boosted? Well, we've been in the job a very short period of time. Sure. The compliance regime under Lloyd's, over, under Lloyd's leadership was invested in considerably. Mm -hmm. We spent an enormous amount of time in the back of the financial crisis as we learned lessons in the financial crisis. So I feel quite good about the regime that we put in place and, the, and the, the work that we do to make sure that our compliance policies and procedures are very, very strong. 
I would also say that we are um, continuing to focus on uh, boosting our capabilities in that arena, and you know, we'll, we'll do that. I uh, just wanted to also touch on, on whether this has had an impact on the underlying business at Goldman Sachs. In, in, since 2013, the Southeast Asian investment banking performance has suffered. According to Refinitiv, you had close to $121, $120 million in fees in 2013. You were ranked second in the region. Since then, it's averaged around $30 to $40 million per year, ranked about seven. Is that because of this, this, this particular issue, or is it unrelated? Well, when we look at our business, particularly in Asia, we look at Asia as a region. Asia is a, Asia is a series of smaller businesses in relatively small countries in terms of the overall uh, profile of the opportunity set there. China would be a significant outlier in terms of the opportunity set that exists in China more broadly. But I wouldn't call out Southeast Asia as a particular, you know, as a particular business that, that you know, swings significantly mm -hmm. one way or the other. Our business in Asia is very strong. I was just there for a week. I saw a number of clients. I've never felt better about our franchise there. We're doing very, very well, and the client reception is quite strong. What about sovereign wealth funds? Have any of them distanced themselves from you uh, in light of this, this public scandal? We've got a very significant presence with sovereign wealth funds. Uh, we do an enormous amount mm -hmm. of business with them across the firm. They're big investors in our, in our investing franchise. I, I, I think those relationships continue to be very strong, and you know, I, I would expect that to continue. Back to the core business, John. Uh, when your four or five-year tenure, I think it was, as head of the investment bank, that part of the business performed incredibly strongly. Uh, as a percentage of total revenue, it, it grew much faster pace uh, than the traditional strength of, of Goldman Sachs, which was trading. Do you expect that shift in, in balance of overall revenues to continue in, in the four or five years ahead? Well, I think the environment for the investment banking business and I'd say for the investment management business in our firm, which is really our private wealth business and our, and our asset mm -hmm. management business, the environment for those two large chunks of the firm has been quite good over the last several years. Contrast that with the market intermediation business or the sales and trading side of the firm, where the environment has been much, much more challenging. Mm -hmm. More regulation, not a lot of yield curve, not a lot of risk appetite, you know, more complicated to, to uh, you know, to really mm -hmm. create revenue and profit in that, sort of, in that side of the business. So it's not surprising that that business wouldn't, wouldn't grow to the same extent and the other businesses would. And I think we continue to focus on building uh, the other businesses as big as we can build them while we watch the securities business improve and we do a lot of work to make sure that it improves. Uh, I was interested, John, to see that uh, you studied English, an arts subject at, at university. What, what, what's your advice to people wanting to come into Wall Street now? You, you've uh, performed very strongly and, and, as we said at the top, congratulations on being president and CEO. What, what skills are needed today on Wall Street uh, to succeed and reach the top? Well, if I could go back and do it again, I would be an engineer. Uh, because if you think about what we're focused on at Goldman Sachs right now, a lot of the the work that we've got to do inside the firm is to make very intelligent and sub substantial technology investments mm -hmm. to build platforms and to automate and to be more efficient on the one hand and to de have create delivery mechanisms for our clients on the other hand. So if I could go back, I would, I would actually rather be an engineer. I can't go back. I was an English major. It has served me well. Uh, but I think, listen, my advice would be there's an enormous amount to learn when you get onto Wall Street. And when you first start, it's an opportunity to ask a lot of questions. There are no stupid questions. You need to immerse yourself in the, in the facts and the mm -hmm. details. You need to learn the analytics. Uh, you need to get some good mentorship. And you need to continue to ask like a sponge and grow. And, and in the long term, uh, when, when people come to measure David and yours uh, tenure uh, together leading Goldman Sachs, what is the one metric or, or measure that you think you want to be measured by ultimately? Well, I don't know that I want to focus on one metric, but I, I, here's what I would say. I think we're going to be very, very focused on long term total shareholder return. So if I had to pick one, that would be it. But mm -hmm. I don't think I want to pick one because there'll be multiple things that we'll, that, we'll, that we'll try to create, you know, that we'll try to use to drive value in the firm. But the true north is going to be long-term shareholder return over, a, over a, a longer period of time. We've been spending an enormous amount of time in the, in the short period of time we've been in the job mm -hmm. focused on really re-underwriting the firm, doing a series of business reviews, David, Stephen, Schur, and myself really mm -hmm. leading an effort to figure out how we feel about the large muscle groups in the firm mm -hmm. and re-underwriting those businesses, all with an eye towards building a strategic plan that we can come out and talk about externally to the outside world that we can hold ourselves accountable for and deliver value over time.